try it again. Thanks, Katie. The reading today comes from the letter to the Ephesians, the fifth chapter, beginning in verse 15. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and psalms, songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. The word of the Lord. May be seated. Good morning, everybody. Great to be here with you. I want to say welcome again to those of you who are joining us online. Really glad that you're here. Those of you who are here in person, thank you so much for being here in what is, uh, was planned to be and certainly still is. Just a beautiful day, right? My name is Steve. If you missed uh, the beginning of the service, my name is Steve Turnbull. I'm one of your pastors here at UALC and really glad for the opportunity to share with you about this incredible passage that we just heard. I think there is in this little snippet out of the letter that an ancient church leader named Paul wrote to some Christians who lived in and around the city of Ephesus in modern day Turkey. I think there is in this passage a powerful vision for life together and the power to live it out. A powerful vision for life together that could change nearly everything in the way that we live together. I think the vision that we learn in this passage has the power to rescue us from the zero-sum, conflict-based power games that are just plaguing and dividing our society, our culture right now. I think at the much more individual level, this passage that we heard shows us a vision for gospel-shaped, Christ-formed lives that have the potential to be deeply healing and transformative in our individual lives and in the relationships that are closest with us, maybe even in our own homes and in our friendships. And I think that this vision for life together has the potential to be transformative for the way that Christians share life together with one another in community. And, to, and as I'll try to share a little bit at the end of the message, has the potential to be transformative for the way that we share life together here at UALC. So I just want to get right into it with you and begin to explain what is being said here in Ephesians chapter 5. If you want to follow along with me, if you've got your own Bible or if you've got your phone and you want to follow along, I will trust there's no uh, basketball game going on right now. You can just read along with me. It's uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Yeah, I watched the highlights from last night. It's Ephesians chapter 5 and it starts in verse 16. Here's what this uh, Paul wrote to the Christians around the ancient city of Ephesus. He started here. Be really careful how you live, he tells them. Be careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Hey, it's Father's Day today, and I'm imagining how a father like me might speak to his children, or you can imagine any parent you know talking to their children. Can't you just imagine saying to your kids, hey, be careful how you live? Like, pay attention. Think about it. There's like a whole current. There's a momentum. There's a way of life in the world that you don't really want to fall into. Watch out in every opportunity. Don't be unwise, be wise. Think about how you live. And he tells them, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And at the end of verse 16, it said, because the days are evil. Don't be foolish, understand what the Lord's will is. Well, what is, what is this wisdom? What is the Lord's will by which we would live our relationships? And then right here in the middle of this passage, there's really only one command. There's one instruction, one command, and it's this in Ephesians 5, verse 18. Don't get drunk on wine, fathers tell their children this all the time, but instead be filled with the Spirit. I just, I find this kind of amusing. There's two places in the New Testament, one is Acts 2, one is Acts chapter 5, where life under the influence of the Spirit is somehow illustrated in contrast with life under the influence of like fermented spirits, you know what I mean? I don't know what we're supposed to learn from that, but here it is. Be filled with the Spirit, and then Paul goes on to illustrate what does that mean? If you're filled with the Spirit, he says there'll be four consequences. And sometimes our English translations don't bring this out quite as clearly. But there's one imperative, one command, be filled with the Spirit. 
it's followed by four participles. These are words that end in ing, and different translations kind of do this a little bit differently, but we do four things. One, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. When we're filled with the Spirit, we encourage one another. Two, singing and making music to, one, to, to the Lord from our hearts. That's number two. And number three, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. And there's a fourth one, but hold on a second. The first three are things we often just think of as how we worship God. We use scriptural and spiritual words to encourage one another. We sing and make music and worship. We've been doing that here in our worship service right now. And the, th- and the third one's gratitude, giving thanks. So speaking to one another, singing and making music, giving thanks. And the fourth one, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. A lot of our Bible translations start a new sentence for a couple of those, including that one. But it's all just one long thing from be filled with the Spirit and therefore do these things. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now every single one of these four probably deserves a whole sermon all on its own. So buckle up, we're going to be here for a while. Thank you for laughing. I'm glad you knew I was kidding. Now, we're going to focus on the last one because in this series, we haven't been talking about every little bit of wisdom from the whole book of Ephesians. It just blows me away. It's too much to take in all at once. We've been focusing on this theme. The whole series has been called One Another. We've been learning how it is that Jesus rescues us from a life that is under the influence, not of the Spirit, but a life that is under the influence of sin and how we are co-conspirators with the power of sin that's wrecking our lives. And the, good, and the good Lord Jesus forgives us for this foolishness by which we cooperate with a pattern of life that steals life from us and wrecks our relationships and instead inaugurates and gives us a whole new way of life and gives us the power of the Holy Spirit by which to live it, by which to see it come true. And we're going to focus on this last one, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, setting aside my will, setting aside my desires, each of us for one another, setting aside the thing that we say, well, that's actually what I want. That would be better for me. But we say, you know what? Because of that, let me just set that aside and let me ask, how can this build you up? What's gonna bless you? What's gonna be better for you? And we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is a cross-shaped way of life. When Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me daily, this is what he means, that we lay down our lives for others. And as soon as Paul says this, he gets concrete about it. He begins to illustrate what this means in some relationships that would have been utterly familiar to all of the people who lived in and around ancient Ephesus. And he describes this, he doesn't talk about all their relationships. These aren't all the relationships that make up human life then or now, but they're three relationships that then we can learn a principle and apply it to the rest of our relationships. He talks about the relationship between a wife and a husband, the relationship between a child and a father, and the relationship, and this one can be hard and foreign to us, the relationship between a slave and a master. And what might not be obvious to us right away, but would have been obvious to everyone who was reading this in this ancient Ephesian context, but would have been obvious to them is that there's one person, there's one person that is the linchpin in all three of these relationships. All these relationships have one person in common. And it's the guy who was the husband, the father, and the master in this household. And he was in charge of everything else. That guy was the boss in the ancient Roman household. Everybody else submitted their wills to his. Everybody else submitted their wills and their bodies to his. They were there to do what was good for him. And everybody in Ephesus would have known that. He had the power of command over his household. And honestly, in many cases, had the power of life and death over the people who were in his household. He could do with everybody else what he wanted. And Paul is addressing these relationships, which would have been, and this is really important, these relationships and this way of understanding relationships, which would have been utterly normal to everybody else. I bet you have things in life that you just take for granted. This is how it works. When X happens, Y follows. It's just the normal course of events. Sometimes I think the things that we regard as normal, whatever it is we take for granted, normal can be the most dangerous thing in the world because we don't think about it, right? But Paul begins his whole passage by saying, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise. Think carefully about how you live. And Paul takes this system of relationships that would have been utterly normal to everybody else in his world and reorders them according to the way of Jesus in the power of the Spirit. He reorders them in the way of the cross, 
which is to teach them, that is, each one to follow the Lord Jesus and to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. To try to drill into this, to get, some, to get the tension, to get the teeth on this teaching, I'm going to drill into one of these relationships this morning, and I'm going to choose the one between the slave and the master, which might seem kind of odd at first and kind of uncomfortable, as a matter of fact. It might seem like it's the one that's furthest away from our context. We would like to believe it's the one that's most irrelevant to us, maybe Maybe in some ways. But it's also the one I think that can be very revealing for us and provides the clue by which we then get to understand how to apply the way of Jesus to all of our relationships, those that are described here and all the rest. And let me begin by asking you a question. And that's this. And it's kind of a hard question. Have any of you ever wished that the Bible would have just come out and abolished slavery? That there'd be like a verse somewhere that's like, seriously, don't do that, that's wrong, no more, no slavery, freedom, emancipation. I I don't know if you've ever wished that or not, I have. And it's a little bit uncomfortable for me to admit that that I have wished that the Bible were something other than what it is. But I remember how this came to me. I remember, probably a lot of us could have wished this for a lot of different reasons. The first place that I began to think about this, I have to admit, was when I was a college student and in my early 20s. And I began to have more conversations with more people who were different from me. And I remember to name one dynamic, talking to people who wanted to critique the whole Christian project, who wanted to disabuse me and undermine what I would have thought as my faith in the goodness of the Bible. And they would say, and they were right, like, don't you know that slaveholders in this very country in like the 18th and 19th centuries, among lots of other examples, used the Bible to justify what they were doing. And they could have turned to this very passage, to what comes after this, and said, look, the Bible itself condones slavery because look, it tells, it regulates it and tells us how to do it well. And that's an uncomfortable truth. So I wanna open that passage with you for a second and understand the logic of what's going on. So let me begin to read this with you. This is from the early part of Ephesians chapter 6, which comes after this explanation for how to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5. It says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear, and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. Let me pause there for a second. I mean, that starts out just pretty conventionally, really. That starts out sounding like you would have expected anybody else in the first century, and sadly, lots of other centuries and places. It sounds like what you might have expected to hear. But then it starts to get a little bit more complicated. Then we get the the instruction that you are not serving people, but serving the Lord wholeheartedly. Not serving people, but serving Christ. And then you have to ask yourself, well, that gets complicated. Because what happens if the master of the household says to do one thing, but Christ says something different? Like, now what am I supposed to do? Who am I supposed to obey in that context? And it starts to undermine the very nature of the relationship and then then it says at the end that the lord will reward each one for whatever good they do whether they are slave or free that to him it doesn't matter which one you are slave or free he's going to reward you for the good you do either way it doesn't make any difference and if it doesn't make any difference to the lord which one you are slave or free then how can there still be slave or free it's a good question And then listen to the next part, what Paul wrote to the masters. And listen carefully. Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Don't threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Now this is more revolutionary. And this is what happens if you read through all three pairs of relationships you find that what Paul writes in the gospel to the one who has less power in this world sounds pretty conventional. And then what he says to the one who has more power in the ways of this world sounds more radical and revolutionary. Paul says to these masters, treat your slaves in the same way. I mean, what does that mean? 
In what way? What is the same way that you could treat each other? In the way of Jesus? In, in the way of submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ and the way of the cross? In the way of I lay down my life for your good, both of you would do this? In the way of people who are equally deserving of love and respect and dignity and relationship? I mean, how would that even work? And then Paul told them, and don't forget, the one who is both their master and yours is in heaven and he's watching you, right? He's paying attention to how you're living and he does not make any distinction between you. He doesn't have any favorites. He doesn't regard the master as better or more important than the slave. If that's the case, how on earth could the whole thing work? How could there still be slavery? Exactly. In this passage, Paul doesn't come out and abolish slavery. But what he says is utterly and ultimately fatal to it. Which later the Ephesians, and I regret and lament that it took us Christians far too long. We have struggled to apply this to understand the time bomb of Christian teaching that Paul attached to the side of this whole horrible thing that ultimately would blow it up. And not only this, but transform all of Christian relationships. Which leaves us asking, like, why didn't he? Why didn't he just say, no, don't do that, do this? And people have a lot of different reasons for that. But in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over all that and point out that within the Christian world, within the Christian household, he actually did also get around to arguing for freedom for slaves among Christians. There's a little letter in the New Testament, a little book in the New Testament that almost nobody ever reads. Have you ever read the book of Philemon? It's just like one chapter. It's less than a page in most editions of the Bible. And the backstory to the book of Philemon is that Paul is in prison, and he meets a runaway slave whose name is Onesimus. Onesimus has run away from his master, whose name is Philemon. And Paul meets Philemon and leads him to the Lord. And Onesimus becomes a disciple of Jesus. And then Paul sends Onesimus back to Philemon, which sounds like the wrong thing to do, terribly risky. And he sends him back with a letter addressed to Philemon and Philemon's family and household and the church that meets in their house. And he says in this letter that Onesimus is carrying to his former master Philemon. If Onesimus owes you anything as he gets back, and surely as a runaway slave, he absolutely owes Philemon something. He, if, he's, if he owes you anything, charge it to my account, right? To put that on my ledger. I'm going to lay down myself for this guy. What Paul is doing is he's acknowledging that Philemon has rights in his world. And rights are such an interesting thing. He acknowledges that Philemon has rights, but then he shows him how Christians use their rights in Christian relationships. If he owes you anything, charge it to my account. And if you consider me a brother... If you consider me a partner in ministry, if you would welcome me, and Paul reminds him, it's like I'm your father in the faith. You owe me your very life. I'm the one who led you, Lord. You owe me everything. <laughs> if you would have welcomed me, then take the welcome you would have given me and welcome him that way. Such a challenge to Philemon. Paul shows him the way of Christ. He shows him, I'm taking my status. I'm taking my rights. I'm taking what's due me, and I'm laying it down for this guy. And so he sends Onesimus for this brother in the Lord. He sends Onesimus back to Philemon. And in that way, Onesimus submits to one another out of reverence for Christ. He submits to his Christian brother Philemon by going back, which was terribly dangerous for him. And then Paul calls Philemon to submit to his brother Onesimus by welcoming him back, which would have been ridiculous in his culture, would have been scandalous in his culture, by welcoming him back no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a brother. I mean, it's a powerful, transformative, cross-shaped, spirit-empowered way of submitting ourselves to one another out of reverence for Christ. And totally unusual, totally not normal. In fact, remember what Paul said at the beginning. Think carefully about this because the days are evil. This is not the way of the world. The world outside of Christ does not see things this way. So just to illustrate that for a second, I want to read you a couple quotations from other ancient teachers who kind of framed the way that the ancient world thinks about these things. So the first one is from Aristotle. Some of you have heard of Aristotle, and I promise you I won't quote from ancient philosophers in every sermon. But let me just read you what Aristotle said about slaves and masters. Aristotle wrote, 
from the hour of their birth, some people are marked out for rule and other people are marked out for subjection. Just nature teaches us. Some people should be submitted and some people should rule. That's the normal way of the world. It's also the total opposite of what Paul said is the way of the gospel, where we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Aristotle continued, the use made of slaves and domestic animals is the same. Isn't this awful to read? Both with their bodies minister to the needs of life. And whose life is that? Somebody else's, right? One person is there for somebody else's good, but that person is not there for the good of the other. And then he offers the rationale for this. He grounds this one direction submission in all of these relationships in this, in this principle. And I want you to notice this. He describes exactly the same three relationships that Ephesians chapter 5 and 6 are written to address. Because this is the way that people in the ancient Roman world saw the world. These were the foundational relationships and this is the way that he worked. He explained it this way. The slave is entirely lacking in the deliberative element. That means the thinking part, the, the ability to deliberate. The slave is entirely lacking in the deliberative element, and the wife has it but without authority, and the child has it but incompletely. All right, this is not Paul's view. This is the pagan Roman view, the Greco-Roman view. Another writer named Plutarch comments on the husband-wife relationship, and he says it's a lot like music where you have to tune the higher strings and the lower strings so they all work out in harmony together. He says it works out best in a household if the husband and wife do everything by harmonious consent as long as the husband does all the leadership. And then Josephus, who was a Jewish writer, not a pagan writer, says this, the woman is in all things inferior to the man. Let her accordingly be submissive, not for her humiliation, but that she may be directed for the authority has always been given by God to the man. All right, here's what I want you to know about this. When Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesian Christians and taught them the gospel of Jesus, taught them the way of life in Jesus, everybody in the ancient Roman world already knew that the husband, father, master was the head of his household. He was the head over all the other people who were there and he told them what to do. He was the one who was in charge. And everybody else submitted their wills and their bodies to his good. And this is really important. Not only did everybody know this, but this household management was a microcosm of the household of the empire. This is how good order was kept in all of society. Because the emperor also was described as being the head of the household of the whole country. This was good, this was good for everybody. And as long as every man was the head of his household and kept everything in good working order, it would all add up and the society would be healthy and the emperor would be honored and every, everybody submitted to the head of the household out of reverence for Lord Caesar. And that's the way it would work out. And Paul speaks into this a revolutionary message. He says there is another king who is not Caesar. And he began to advocate for them, as the book of Acts says, laws and customs which are not right for us Romans. Laws and customs which would turn the world upside down. He said, in, in the body of Christ, we follow the one who laid down his life for others. And so we submit to one another out of reverence for the Lord Christ, not the Lord Caesar. When I see the revolutionary power, the explosive power of this principle for living, and the power of the Holy Spirit that Paul says makes it possible, overcomes our human nature and makes it possible, then I realize that I was actually hoping for too little out of the Bible. When I wanted the Bible to set aside one set of rules and laws by which we ordered society and give us just a new set of rules that we could just apply, replace the old ones or add them to the old ones or something like that, I was asking for too little. Instead, what the Bible gives us is an entirely different vision by which to order all of our relationships, the way of the cross and the power of the Spirit to make it all come true. And this vision of mutual submission in Christ is genius. It accomplishes for us what we in our humanity could never accomplish on our own. The first thing is that it's not about winning and losing anymore. You know, when you look around at the world, and I mentioned at the beginning of the message today, all the zero-sum, conflict-based power games that we play in our society, 
every time somebody on the bottom, and this is, like, world history could be told this way. Every time there's one group of people who's on the bottom of some society, and they're just sick and tired of taking it to the people who are on the top, and you can understand why they would be. And, they just, and it's finally time they have a revolution and overthrow the people who are on top, and then they just replace the people who are on top and become a different version of the thing they hated in the first place, and usually by violence. But what the gospel says is that among Christians, it's not about who's on the bottom and can throw down who's on the top. It's not about who goes high and who goes low. It's about how we all go low together in Christ. We all humble ourselves in the Lord, and he lifts us up together. And because it's mutual submission, it guards against the risk for exploitation and abuse so rampant in human life and community. Because when all you do is say to one person in a relationship or one group in a society, you submit over and over and over and over again. The risk for abuse and exploitation is just rampant. But when each one is called, and we've been guilty of this, but when each one is called to lay it aside for others, then not abuse and exploitation, but rather a beautiful harmony of people walking together in the way of Jesus. And because this isn't a set of rules, it's not a code, it's not laws, it's driven by the power of the Spirit, it actually can orchestrate and transform all of our relationships. It's not, because it's it submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. We serve others and we also let them serve us as the Spirit leads in any individual set of circumstances. There's this campy old Christian song that I've really become a fan of over the years and uh, I like it even though it's a campy old song. I think it I think it might be called the servant song, but I forgot to ask anybody before and find out that's right or not. But the lyrics go like this. Bro uh, Brother, let me be your servant and pray that I might have the grace to let you be my servant too. Because that's hard for us. We can get our heads around the idea that I should sacrifice a little bit of my time and set it aside and volunteer for somebody else. But to let you be my servant too is to sacrifice my pride, to admit that I have needs, to be vulnerable. But in Christ, it's a powerful way of spirit-driven living that no set of principles or laws could ever orchestrate for us, but the Holy Spirit can. It's the way we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So I read this passage and I realize that Paul didn't abolish slavery or any of the other power games by which we sometimes organize our relationships. He didn't abolish it, he crucified it. He put it all under the sign of the cross for the body of Christ and empowered it by the empowering presence of God, by his Holy Spirit. So I'm gonna finish today by sharing with you just a, a real brief thing that I think extends this principle into a whole variety of other relationships, and you can carry this out by your own discernment, by the power of the Spirit into the relationships in your life. But I was sitting in my office a couple of years ago, and I was thinking about the kind of future to which God's calling us as a church. So how does it work when we get... When we live together, gospel-shaped, Christ-formed lives, what sort of church community would we be? And I, I wrote down this little imagination. I just want to share it with you right now. I imagined it this way. I said, we at UALC, we will put others first in our ministries, and we will look to the interests of others before ourselves. So our older members, elders, will ask, but does this reach and disciple the next generation? And younger generations will ask, but are we honoring and serving our elders? And long-tenured members will say, how well does this work for the new people? And long-serving leaders will ask, am I making room for others to grow and use their gifts? And newer people, up-and-comers, will add their own contributions to something bigger than themselves. And I might have continued to add, and those who really like the music to be this way will say, but how does it work for people who like it that way and that way, this way, and People who worship at the Mill Run campus will say, but does this cause blessing and flourishing at our Lythen Road campus? And the Lythen Road campus will say, but does this cause the gospel to be formed and flourish at our Mill Run campus? And all of us would be laying down our lives for others as we submit to one another in the way of Jesus, in the way of the cross, by the power of the Spirit, out of reverence for Christ. I believe that's what God accomplishes among us, and I pray that God will make it so. Let me pray for us right now. Lord Jesus, we love you, and we receive your gift in our lives. I confess to you that I have far too often asserted my own will out of reverence for me. I pray for your forgiveness. I pray for your direction. I pray for your power. And I know that in our flesh, we can't create this. We, we mess it up. 
But I pray that you would create in us the kind of life that we never could do, but you can do. That you would create life here on earth according to your will on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.